let's go back to 1985 and the creation of AOL, because you were in many ways the sort of the original digital disruptor. Mm -hmm. And what was that like? What were the ramifications of it? And then we'll talk about how you then became disrupted yourself. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. Chicago's a great city, and I, I applaud Brad and, and Eric for, for hosting this, even though Groupon, which is, of course, a great success story here in Chicago, we compete, we, our company, Living Social, based in D.C., is a competitor. But I'm here anyway because I love what they're doing and love <laughs> Chicago Ideas Week. Uh, when we got started, uh, first of all, I should say, about 30 years ago, I read a book by Alvin Toffler called The Third Wave. He also wrote Future Shock and a bunch of books. But this, this really captivated me because he talked at the time, and I think it was 1979, 1980, about the idea of an electronic cottage. Someday it, we'd have this new way to interact and get information and communicate and so forth. And even though it was viewed as kind of futuristic and kind of wacky by a lot of people, I just, I just knew that was going to happen. Uh, but when I graduated from college in 1980, there were no companies really to go to that were doing this. I worked for some larger companies, Procter & Gamble and PepsiCo for a little while. Uh, and then got involved in joining the company in 1983 in the D.C. area, which actually struggled and failed, but then started with two other folks, uh, uh, AOL, in, in uh, 1985. Even then, only 3% of people were online. And the people who were online were online an hour a week. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the time, some, of, some folks won't remember this, but some will, most people didn't have personal computers. The few that did, most didn't have modems. Indeed, you have to go to a, the peripheral section of the computer store to get this thing called a modem. So basically, people viewed it as sort of an optional thing. We thought it was the main event. We thought that someday would be a big deal. But in those early days, it took a while to con convince people. So in fact, I think it's four years to finally get IBM to build a modem into a PC. So it was an integrated part of the, 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 the system. And it wasn't until 1991 that actually was legal for a service like ours, a commercial online service, to connect to the internet. Up until 1991, the internet was for non-commercial use, governments, you know, educational institutions. Uh, and when we went public in 1992, it was the first internet company to go public, most people didn't really understand what it was all about, and most were pretty skeptical that anybody would ever want to, large numbers of people want to do. So I think the simple answer is a long slog over a decade, really, to get traction. And then finally, it kind of became a, more of a, you know, there was more momentum around it. And I think that's true for a lot of big, transformative, disruptive ideas. They, they rarely happen overnight. They usually require entrepreneurs who really are going to take a long-term, built-to-last, persevere, be patient, be passionate, uh, and eventually that idea can, it can change the world. So, right, because the, the old saying, an overnight success takes 20 years to right. make. But the perception is, is that it's happening right then. So one of the things that you, you probably don't get credit for is AOL really did start the notion of, of social, right. which is so dominant now. Uh, I mean, I remember AOL chat rooms mm -hmm. and things like that that then got a little bit shunted aside. So was that another vision that you had? That no, really we, we, when we started, we, we believed that there were a lot of things that were important to build the medium. You had to make it easy to use, make it useful, make it fun, make it affordable, a bunch of diff different things. And you also had to focus on you know, content and commerce and connectivity and community, what we called the, the C's. But we always believed the killer app was community. It was people interacting right. with each other. And so we did focus more than most others on on chat rooms and instant messaging, which we created probably 20 buddy lists, things like that 25 years ago. We believe the soul of the medium was people and interaction. And that also was viewed as kind of mm -hmm. wacky at the time uh, because people were like, why, why would people want to do that? Like, it seems kind you of know, weird. When I was reading those quotes, just you're saying, saying it now, it sounds exactly like Mark Zuckerberg. Well, Mark, the first time I met him, there's two things I remember about that. It was probably four or five years ago. The first was I realized that he wasn't even born when I got started in this <laughs> industry, which is kind of a little humbling, I guess. And the second is he, he said he learned how to program when he was 11 or 12 by hacking into the AOL instant messenger system. And apparently he was quite good at it. He was, he was quite proud of how he had, had us always on the, on the edge. But, but he's done a great job. And the fact that eight years ago, the, he, took, he took an idea, and now it's a billion users all around the world. It's a, it's a phenomenal success. So let's talk uh, for two seconds about AOL Time Warner, which is now just Time Warner. And it was one of the, again, it was called a merger. In fact, it was AOL buying Time Warner, which nobody seemed to talk about. And then it became this uh, incredible 
operatic disaster. I mean, how did that, could it have been averted? Yeah, I think yeah. It, it, it could have. I mean, it, it, it was 12 or 13 years ago we did the, the almost 13 years ago we did the, the merger. Uh, and the idea at the time of taking the largest internet company and the largest media company with also the largest cable systems with broadband we knew was the future and putting them together in a world that was going to converge, I think most people at the time agreed made a lot of sense strategically. Indeed, Microsoft and Disney, a lot of companies were marching on Washington to try to block it because of the, the, the fear that it would be uh, too powerful. Uh, but the lesson for me there is actually something that Thomas Edison, one of America's greatest inventors and entrepreneurs, said over 100 years ago, which is vision without execution is hallucination. The idea is one thing, but it's about execution, which is about people, mm -hmm. and therefore about culture and different, you know, different kind of perspectives. So recognizing that it's one thing to say it or proclaim it. If you look at the press release that we put out talking about the future, this was before the iPod came out. We said digital music was going to be a big deal, before YouTube was invented, before Facebook and Twitter and other things were invented. Uh, and the ideas were, were one thing, but the execution really was lacking. And I think that's been an important kind of lesson for all of us. Um, yeah, someone said to me that what, it would have worked if AOL fired its top 40 people and Time Warner fired yeah. its top 40 people, and then I said I said the same thing. It's a little bit like the way the White House works. Every whether, every time there's an election, uh, when there's a new president, basically everybody leaves the White House uh, and their whole new team comes in and brings a, a kind of a fresh perspective. If you put all these assets under one company, the company combined had like 40 billion dollars of revenue, and basically fired both management teams and hired somebody <laughs> from yeah. you know, whatever central, central casting to bring in a new management team, it would have worked work better. So in starting Revolution and in the investments that you make, which are across a really interesting variety of things that I'd love to talk about, are there lessons that you're using from those days in terms of which startups to invest sure. in, where to, where, to, you know, where to help and where to recede? Well, I think there's two, two major themes that we're, we're, we're focused on I think would be you know, potentially relevant to, to this group. The first is what I think of as the second Internet Revolution. The last 25 years was sort of the first Internet Revolution, getting people to understand what it is and take it seriously and get connected. Now multiple devices and multiple networks. And you know, I now think everybody would agree the Internet is part of everyday life. The second Internet Revolution is not so much about creating Internet companies but rather creating companies that use the internet, particularly the ubiquity and the mobility of the internet, to transform other important aspects of our life. So education is a big focus. Healthcare is a big focus. These are really important parts of people's everyday life, really significant parts of our economy, really huge industries uh, that haven't really uh, been disrupted yet, and I think will over the next 25 years. A second theme is what we've called the rise of the rest. We think there's too much focus on Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is awesome. There's awesome companies there. It's, it's a pride of America, really the, you know, in some ways the envy of the world. It will continue to be a robust, in the most robust kind of regional entrepreneurial ecosystem. But there are many other regions around the nation, including in Chicago, that are developing great entrepreneurial ecosystems. And part of the reason I agreed to chair the Startup America Partnership about a year and a half ago was to celebrate that and build up regional efforts. We've now launched in 30 different regions with these startup regions, really creating more of a network density in each of these, these regions. So as a result, with the revolution, we're also looking to invest in those places where there are great entrepreneurs with great companies, but maybe they're a little bit off the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the beaten path. I think that creates opportunities, but also, frankly, you take a step back and don't just focus on your own activities, your own investments in my case, but what's in really the national interest, maintaining our lead as the world's most entrepreneurial nation is a really important deal because other countries are starting to figure this out. Uh, they're stepping up their game around access to capital, around talent, immigration policies, things like that. And there really is a risk that if we get cocky or complacent as a nation, we're going to lose that, that, that lead. And trying to get folks in Washington to focus on that. We had some success this year with the, as the Jump Starting Our Business Startups Act, which legalized right. crowdfunding and, and created an on-ramp for IPOs. Now the focus you know, after the election will be on Startup Act 2.0, which deals particularly with the issue of high-skilled immigration, winning the global battle for talent. This is critical stuff if we're going to remain in the lead as, as the most entrepreneurial nation. And others, as I said, are figuring it out. And other investors in the United States are starting to look at these global opportunities. Excel, we talked about Facebook. They were the venture firm in Silicon Valley that backed Facebook. Tremendous success. A decade ago, all of their investors, all their venture capitalists, were in Silicon Valley. Now they have more investors in China than they do in Silicon Valley. 
That should be a cause of concern mm. if you think about the United States and its entrepreneurial leadership, because really the reason we're the leading economy in the world is of the work of entrepreneurs. It didn't happen by accident. Fortune 500 companies don't just pop up. They, they start as startups, and they, you know, they build, build success and, and industries all around them, and, and that's why the cities were built around these entre enterprises, entrepreneurs, and, and these industries were built, and that's why you know, we wake up and we're the leading economy in the world. We need to make sure we understand what got us here, which was entrepreneurship, and we double down as a nation to make sure we preserve our, our, our lead in what clearly is a much more competitive world. You know, I've always wondered why, if we're the most entrepreneurial nation in the world, we use a French word for that <laughs> instead of an English word. But you've been very outspoken about this idea, which should be a bipartisan idea, of basically stapling a green card right. onto the PhD diploma for, of any you know, uh, international student who's here who gets a PhD in one of the sciences. I mean, it, it does seem to me Unfortunately, I don't even want to talk about the gridlock in Washington, but the fact that the two, the two sides can't agree on something like that, which is so critical and essential and makes so much sense, is kind of a tragedy. Yeah, but maybe Time Magazine should do a cover story on the issue and highlight the importance <laughs> of it. No, it, it, it is, it, but the frustrating thing is, the, it's the good news and bad news. The, the, the good news is people do realize, Republicans and Democrats, that entrepreneurship is important, more than they did maybe a few years ago and that talent is critically important. So, so getting the right immigration policy makes sense. Uh, on this issue of stapling a green card, about half of the people now coming to the great university in the United States, you know, MIT and Carnegie Mellon and so particularly the engineering side, are from other nations, which is great. What's not so great is once we give them this great you know, education and, and these degrees, for the most part, we kick them out of the country, mm -hmm. force them to go back to their country to create companies there that then compete with companies here. And it's insane, and people recognize that. So there is growing bipartisan support for it. Uh, President Obama's come out in support of it. Mitt Romney's come out in support with it. For it. It, it, the challenge is to build, a, get a focus on this issue of entrepreneurship and innovation and talent, and deal with this in a in an isolated kind of way, as a res, as opposed to dealing with it in the context of broader issues with immigration, which are really important and really sensitive and really complicated and really emotional. But that broader, comprehensive immigration debate ends up kind of, kind of not allowing us as a nation to focus on this more immediate threat, in my opinion, uh, which is losing our, our entrepreneurial edge. And, and ultimately, it does come down to talent, whether it be any company or any organization only as good as its people. And being a magnet for the best and brightest is important. Almost half of the Fortune 500 companies were started by first or second generation immigrants. 40% of high tech companies in Silicon Valley started by first or second generation immigrants. So we're gonna lose a generation of these companies if we don't move quickly, urgently, uh, to deal with this issue. No, that's a, that's a vital issue. In fact, the, that phrase, rise of the rest, is, is, is a phrase actually I think our own Fareed Zakaria yeah. basically created it, to talk about not, to explain, it's not so much we are going through decline in the 21st century, but that other countries around the world are rising and competing with us, which should actually be a good thing. Um, now, critical to that and critical to entrepreneurship is also education. Mm -hmm. and, and Revolution has some interesting education startups that you guys are, have invested in. I'd love you to talk about that. Well, there, there's really uh, two sides of Revolution. Revolution Ventures, which is earlier stage, and Re Revolution Growth, which is kind of later, later stage. We've done some on, on both. Around. Well, actually, one in the early stage, we did in partnership with our friends uh, Brad and Eric at Light Bank, despite a living social group on battle. Uh, and it's a, a local company here called Bench Prep that's trying to do, do a better job of, I guess there's a few Bench Prep folks here, uh, try to take the whole test preparation you know, business, which really is its own little industry, but kind of inefficient, and move that online and make it much easier for people uh, when they're studying for an SAT or a GRE or, or, or things like that. So it's relatively early stage. Uh, a later stage, one we did, is a company called Echo360 that basically is now partnering with 600 universities all around the nation and working with them to help them introduce different forms of blended learning, or what some have called the flipped classroom. Uh, and so it starts with capturing lectures, so people, you know, they're stored. If you miss a, le a lecture, you can watch it you know, later in the dorm, or if you want to watch some part of it again, you can watch it later. But over time, there's a lot of interesting innovations happening around how do you, in this new world, kind of reinvent the process of, of, of learning. 
Uh, and we believe working with existing universities who've been at it for you know, decades, in some cases centuries, and helping them innovate and, and, and move kind of into this, this new, new era uh, is, is important. So both of those uh, kind of things are, are important, whether it be test prep or, or higher ed, whether it be earlier stage or later stage. I think there's going to be hundreds of these ventures uh, around education, hundreds around healthcare that really are going to be disruptive and transform things. And it, there's a dynamic that you see and again, I saw this as, as AOL grew, and certainly after the merger with Time Warner, that the early stage, these entrepreneurs are real disruptors, real attackers. They're attacking the status quo, saying there's a better way, convinced that there is, there, there is a, a, a way forward that's going to be better for, for their, their potential customers, uh, and they're just in this attack mode. At some point, companies get to a certain scale, and they become more defenders, uh, and they're more trying to protect the status quo. Most Fortune 500 companies are kind of defenders. This actually was part of the issue with AOL and Time Warner. We kind of had an attacker culture. Time Warner had more of a, a, a defender culture. And it's more about protecting the business model, making the quarterly earnings. It's a different kind of mindset. We like backing the attackers. We like the, backing the folks that really are trying to change the world, taking enormous risk, uh, uncertain path forward, but really believe there is a better way. And as a, as a nation, I think we need to make sure we remain and not, not, I don't mean it's any military context, but main, maintain an attacker mentality, really challenging the status quo and trying to, to innovate across all sectors. Yes. In fact, I think education, as you realize, is, the, is such a ripe mm -hmm. sector for disruption. Our mm -hmm. mutual friend Walter Isaacson, who famously wrote the Steve Jobs biography, but before that wrote a brilliant, brilliant biography of Benjamin Franklin, said, if Franklin came back today, the one part of our society that he would recognize is the classroom. He'd walk in and say, oh, there's a teacher writing on a blackboard. Right. But nothing has changed. Um, one of the areas where there is a lot of disruption is, is, is Zipcar, which I mentioned in the introduction. That's a, we, we made the, the founder of Zipcar one of the time, 100 a couple of years ago. That's a really interesting area that's stayed kind of static for a while. And I don't know, is there a Zipcar in Chicago? Of course. Yeah, OK, sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, I think the idea there, and it's part of this broader th theme, which I think is interesting, which we call the sharing economy, that there, there is a whole generation of people that are going to, mostly what some are called millennials, who are going to be more interested in access and use and sharing than ownership. And, and cars are an example of that. Uh, real estate and other things are examples as well. And this whole sharing economy is developing across a whole slew of, 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 of sectors. Uh, but car sharing, like in, in a city like, uh, like in Chicago, it's actually crazy to own a car. On average, people spend about $1,000 a month when you look at all the cost of ownership and you know, insurance and a garage and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and they end up using it less than 5% of the time. So if you actually divide the cost by the hours of use, it's extraordinary. But it, it was sort of people just kind of used to it. And it's kind of like almost like the American way. You should like own a car. Uh, and they wanted the convenience of it. They wanted something that was in their apartment building or at their, at their office. When you now have the ability through the internet, it goes back to this idea of the second internet revolution, you have the ability to have people carrying in their pocket a device that tells them what cars are a block away, and they can reserve them and walk up to them and push a button and open them and drive away and return an hour or two later. It has all the convenience of ownership without the expense and hassle of ownership. Mm -hmm. That unlocks an entire new uh, marketplace, an entire new industry. And there are many other examples like that that we think are really interesting as part of this, this notion of a sharing economy. So if, if we look at that, mobile device, right? If you're carrying a, a computer in your pocket that was way more powerful than any desktop in right. 1985. What are the other and areas? More po po you know, powerful than any mini computer in 1985. Um, what are the other areas that, as a result of that technology, which, which, by the way, has penetrated across the globe faster than any technology really in history? Right. What are the other areas that are ripe for disruption? Well, it, the, the, the focus on the juxtaposition of mobile, uh, local, and social right. is where a lot of interesting you know, companies are, are being formed now. And you, and you see the ability to grow companies much more, more quickly. I mentioned when we got started, only 3% were online. Now there's 2 billion people online around the world. Uh, and as you say, many of them, their principal device, or in some cases, their only device is, is, is their phone. That allows you to create businesses that couldn't have existed even, even 10 years ago across all the sectors that are, that are interesting to people and are important aspects of, of their life. And healthcare, for example, yes. I, I'd be one example. The, the 
Part of the reason healthcare has not changed that much, but will, is because there's some institutional biases based on how people pay for things. Essentially, consumers don't really make the decisions for the most part about what to do, and somebody else, your employer, the government, somebody is, 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 pay, is paying for it. As a result, there's been a, you know, kind of over, over decades, people almost kind of outsource those decisions to, to, to somebody else. The new technology, particularly the smartphone, is essentially enabling people to carry with them a very powerful device that keeps track of, of different kind of, of, of things, partly using different kind of uh, mobile devices. And that's going to give people much more information. It's personalized information that will enable them to make better choices for themselves and, 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 and their families, particularly in the whole kind of wellness space. So I think there's going to be a whole revolution around consumer of healthcare and leveraging new kinds of technology, particularly uh, smartphones and, and, and different kind of devices that really are going to finally change a system that really has not changed too much. And it's a big part of one-sixth of our economy. It, 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 it's, it's a critical part of, of our the deficit problem, which is really a, a big, big, you know, big problem for, for a nation. So using new technology to give consumers better tools to make better choices to manage their health is, is incredibly important. So one thing, and, and I'm going to mention it even though you didn't, another whole area that you're dedicated to is the Case Foundation, mm -hmm. which is doing great work led by your wife, Jean. Right. Who's in, here? In national service and all kinds of things that are very important that are very old fashioned that need to be updated too. So I want to thank Steve Case, one of the thank original Thank you all. Great to be in Chicago. Still disrupting.